Um, so I'll just start recording now. So welcome to the Data Science Across Sectors event. Uh, very happy to be here today, uh, joined by our speakers today. Uh, my name is Rodrigo. I'll be the host for this event. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, just a little bit of context. Data Science Across Sectors is a uh, speaker panel event uh, where, we focus about, where we focus on the applications of data science across the many industries, uh, such as the ones you'll see today. Uh, so without further ado, uh, before we get started, uh, I'd like everyone here in the Zoom to please mute yourself before we start the presentations out of respect uh, for our speakers. If you do have any questions, uh, please do wait until the Q&A section uh, at the end of the, of the presentations today. Uh, if the question can't wait, you can uh, leave it in the chat and then we'll, we can address it at the very end. Uh, also, please, for your question, if your question is um, directed at a, a specific speaker, uh, please do mention the speaker that the question is for uh, so that we can, um, so that the speaker can, can answer it uh, appropriately. Um, and please also um, turn off your video for, for this event as some internet providers can't handle it. And feel free to, to use the chat as much as you'd like, uh, but please uh, do save your questions until the Q&A section. Uh, but without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Um, so our speakers for today are Mr. Zvi, uh, Mr. Naga, and Mr. Alexander. Uh, so Mr. Zvi is a senior data scientist at Loblaws. Uh, Mr. Naga is a data scientist at uh, the Kraft & Heinz company. And Mr. Alexander is a performance data scientist at the Vancouver Whitecaps Football Club. And uh, as our first speaker, I'd like to uh, hand it over now to Mr. Naga, uh, who is a data scientist at Kraft and Heinz, as mentioned. Uh, he'll be kicking us off. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Mr. Naga, whenever you're ready, you can uh, start presenting. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks for giving me this opportunity, firstly. So let me share my screen first, and let's get started. Share screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yeah, cool. So you all know, like, my name is Naga, and this Javeri Potiwal is my surname, to be honest. So I work as a data scientist, too, at Kraft Heinz Canada. It's been around, like, one year for now, approximately. Uh, about me, uh, to walk you all through, like, I'm a sports person and then comes a data-driven person, because eventually I should be loving the job I do, right? And even you should in future hopefully. Uh, initially started my career as a data analyst back in home and now and maybe forever a data scientist. So did my master's at University of Waterloo in ECE, which is electrical and computer engineering and specialization in the field of AI and ML, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning. So this is a, like a quick timeline of my career. So initially back in my home country, I did my undergraduation in ECE again and did technology entrepreneurship program from Indian School of Business. And eventually, we as a team had a Capestone project and we, want, we, we all wanted it to take it further but could not succeed in seed funding stages. Later on, a disappointed person like me took a job as a data analyst. I mean, I never know what a data analyst would actually do, but I took, took it up. So I was playing around tools like MS Excel for much of my early career using like wheel cups and pivot tables, et cetera. Later, move, move towards visualization tools like Power BI. Then as I was closely working out with the data and following some journals and blogs like Medium Post, et cetera, I could see some transformations taking place in the industries towards data side. So I packed my bag, applied some university to, universities to learn about machine learning and luckily got an opportunity to study at University of Waterloo. While I was studying, I was parallelly working as a overnight freight associated at Home Depot, where I was actually uh, using some of the tools like order picker, forklift, which are not at all related to data science, to be honest. But eventually was learning some of the terminologies associated with CPGs, like what is a SKU, uh, SKU what is a SKU means, and what is UPC, et cetera, et cetera. I thought that might be helpful for me in my early career at Canada. So... Later on, after my graduation, I applied for multiple job roles, like, I mean, the same job role, which is data scientist, but 
multiple companies and got many rejections so some of my friends were very supportive at that time and some were wanting me to quit this passionate journey of finding a job in data science field apparently i did not give up and landed in a quite good position right now hmm so i just wanted to add a humor like which way did the data scientists go i mean you can replace this data scientists to data analyst or data engineer but the answer remains same so i feel the answer would be they went the data way so we all love data so without data we wouldn't be possible right here right today so to tell about my company like like some bit of facts and truths you might find it in google but to be honest it is a multinational company and it is one among the trusted producer of high quality and nutritious food and we are one among top fortune 500 brands and we have a global sales about like 25 billion mm, and and i wanted to speak about like like what according to me is a data science for me so data science is not about like making complicated models or like sophisticated models and making some awesome visualization uh, notebooks or like or writing a beautiful code but it is all about using the data to create as much as impact as possible or value to the organization you work for now this impact can be in the form of insight or let's say product recommendation etc so now to create this insights or product recommendations we might require some tools so that tools might be making this complicated models or visualizations using tableau machine learning algorithms etc cetera, etc cetera. but the real problem is to solve the company's problem with the help of the data and we do not care about what tools we use to solve them so to process the data, so initial days like to process the data now the data has been growing so we require parallel compute, computing technologies like spark hadoop etc also if you guys notice we are totally shifting knowledge driven approaches to data driven approaches for now so uh, i i worked in like couple of parts in data i mean data science at craft heinz has multiple parts but out of which i worked for like maybe two or three where i was totally responsible for like test and learn stores comparing similar stores to understand preferences item index algorithm trade area algorithm and lastly right now i'm working for craftomatic application where i build propensity models so i just wanted to speak about test and learn stores because that's being my favorite so so to identify similar store patterns based on store attributes so we have like uh, to be honest we have pos data which is point of sales data so you you get like which province did a person purchase what product etc cetera, etc cetera. so we have like lot of hierarchy towards a product so it comes from province to banner type from category and then store sales and growth can be computed using this year sales versus previous year sales and then we have consumer segments now overall we have like around 6726 stores and 32 categories seven banner types 13 provinces 64 prism segments so if you actually multiply all this that's a that's a very big number you cannot actually do it manually so manual analysis is like a big no to this question or a problem which we are solving and and then the solution that came up in our mind is like clustering so now now clustering is a simple thing which we all know like we as a students are studying studied what clustering would do like form a cloud compacts between the data finding the pattern because it is unsupervised learning but when you work for an organization you need to take accountability of some of the things like what are the resources what are we trying to solve the problem so in our case the resources was like we wanted to solve everything on the fly so we don't want some some let's say because the pos data we get is like weekly like every week we get the data so we wanted it to be fly because we wanted to run the refreshed models each and every time the user wants to see the see any any number of combinations he want so we wanted clustering and you all know like types of clustering you have like four connectivity models centroid models and then comes distribution models and density models now 
these are some of the examples within these models. Now we have to actually choose which model we should actually leverage on. So out of all these models, we we are actually more keen into like because it is an on the fly product. So we wanted it to be fast in terms of compute capacity. So we we went through this K means and K meteorites at the end. So now the pros and cons of K means are like as similar as you read in your books. That is like uh, it it cannot actually take in categorical data. Again, you need to do some sort of pre-processing to send categorical data into it. And it is sensitive to outliers because we compute mean. So mean is always a sensitive to outliers. So then, then comes, if, if you are actually taking sensitivity into accountability, then we can actually replace mean with median. Then we get k meteorites. And, and I think some of the questions I wanted to answer before before I give up to other speaker is like, how did I gain interest in data science? So basically while I was working as a data analyst back in home, I know, noticed there is a lot of potential towards data and related fields. And if you look the world five to eight years ago, it, it used to be all about business analy analytics, business intelligence, data science. That has quickly moved into machine learning. Maybe in near future, we might head towards blockchain, which we are already into. So the world is moving around. In, at a rapid speed and I don't do not want it to lag behind it. So also also I wanted to ask my, ask myself how do I think you all can leverage like you all students can leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning to create value that is data driven. So I think as you all know that the projects and assignments you do at university level are purely based upon open source data sets like I think, Iris dataset and MNIST dataset, et cetera. For me, those datasets are clean in nature and you do not need to do any sort of reprocessing or much of feature engineering as the features are already known. And I mean, the data is too, too clean to be worked on and, and any algorithm you send the data into it, it, it gives beautiful results, like around accuracy, around 98% or 99%. So I strongly re recommend you all to like sign up for Kaggle, get some data, which is not clean, find some insights, build your own models. If you're caught up with lots of stuff like studies, assignments, personal life, et cetera, I strongly suggest you guys to go through Medium, follow some blogs, see Kaggle, how others approach the problem. By this, you can get the problem solving skills. So my whole and soul story, never get yourself misaligned from data, make data a routine in your life because that's where you land up your job and you should actually know what you're doing. So, and this question as of 22, is data science a growing field in your, within your industry and you, why do you think it will grow or shrink? So it is a big yes for me because we, we right now has like 6,000 stores and there are like multiple product, products within Kraft and & Heinz and these products are growing each and every day. So. So the point of sales are increasing. So the data is getting increased day by day. So, so the data scientist would never, no, never ever like in our organization will never ever get into a situation where they are, they are to be laid off or like no data scientists require in future. So how to approach breaking into field or industry as industry interested students? Okay, I think I already answered this question before. Yeah. So yeah, this is all about how Kraft and Heinz uses this data science, et cetera, and how some of the projects I've listed and out of which test and control stores is one of my favorite. So that's it for now, I guess. Do you all have any questions for me? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Naga. That was uh, really insightful uh, to hear. Uh, I think we will save questions uh, towards the end. So please do hold on to your questions. Yeah, yeah, um, but yeah, it was uh, really interesting to hear uh, your involvement in, in Kraft and Heinz. And what really stood out to me was your uh, perseverance, especially in your early stages of your career, all those rejections. And yeah, um, it, it's good to, to hear that um, you were able to find your feet and, and, and move along in your career. Uh, so that's that's really inspiring. So thank you for thank you for sharing. For yeah. sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so now, uh, 
I'd like to introduce our, our next speaker, uh, who is Mr. Alexander Hinton. Uh, so Alec, Alex is a performance data scientist working right now at Vancouver Whitecaps. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to pass it on to him and he can get started. Thanks, Rodrigo. Uh, I'll just try to get my screen sharing here. Can you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, I'll just go over so what I plan to talk about today. So the first few minutes, I'll just talk a bit about my background, how I got into my uh, into the field, into my role. I'll talk about uh, data science at the Vancouver Whitecaps, which is, uh, as Rodrigo said, where I'm working, which is a professional soccer team. Um, go over some of the typical uh, data sources that we have, some a quick run through of a a project that we can look at, uh, and then I'll finish with some, some lessons that I've learned uh, in my journey as a data scientist. Uh, so quick, I won't talk too much about myself, but as I said, uh, work with the Vancouver Whitecaps uh, professional soccer team in the MLS, and I've been working there uh, a year and a half. So previous to that, I studied uh, just down the road from you guys uh, at University of Guelph, maybe a, maybe a rival, I'm not sure, I did stats and economics. Um, and then a couple of years later, did a master's degree in economics at, at Guelph as well. Uh, and that's where I kind of just started to get the bug for sports analytics. So I ended up, I was in a thesis, actually a research, a research based master's and a research course in my master's. And I did a project looking at the sunk cost fallacy in the MBA. And it was in that project, I started to realize, okay, I really like playing with data. I really like, um, I was learning, I learned some Python. And so that's how a couple of years later, I wanted to really go further down that field. Apparently really like school because I did another master's this time at uh, UBC uh, in data science. Um, I say over here that uh, one of the main reasons I went to the University of Guelph and really I would say during my undergrad and during my master's, my main focus was actually triathlon, less, less on school. Um, I was competing uh, competed at the world championships, the U23 level, I was kind of racing and training uh, all over the world. So that was kind of, that was what I was really into until 2019. And then, then I transitioned, I said I should focus up a bit more professionally here. And that's when I did the, uh, the masters at UBC. And in that pro, uh, in that masters, I did a project, uh, our capstone project was looking at fitness data. So the physical data that the players uh, output during practices and games and the capstone project was to evaluate their their fitness and their fatigue um and a, a month after that project finished i was able to get hired with the white caps full time uh so i've been there since since summer 2020 so that's definitely enough about me so i'll start talking a bit about uh what data science looks like at the white caps um so in our in our organization we have uh, we can sort of imagine split up in two ways. We have a soccer side, the sporting side, and then we have the business side. Um, so I will only be talking about on the soccer side because that's uh, that's where I'm working. There's definitely a lot of data being done on the business side. You can think about you know, taking in projections, marketing, uh, that sort of stuff. But that is a different department uh, from my own. So if you think about what does data science look like in a sporting environment, you might might know that the movie Moneyball is sort of a typical reference point. Um, it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it, but it's not exactly what my day to day looks like. Um, so what so how we have set up data science and this is a relatively new thing in the, in the sports uh, sphere and at our club. So we've had a data science department since 19, uh, so a couple of years before I got there, but we don't consider ourselves, not, our structure isn't that we are another department. So you can think of in a soccer team, you have obviously the coaching staff, you can have you know, an executive team who's in, a recruitment team in charge of bringing in players, uh, transferring players from different leagues. We have physical preparation to do working with uh, players' fitness and physical readiness. And our job is basically to support all of those people. So we try to think that all decision makers in the club, regardless of what department they're in, they're supported by us to help make their decisions more informed. Um, so, you know, we on a day-to-day -day, day, day -day -day basis, we're working with uh, the video analysis department in terms of opposition scouting, 
we're working alongside the scouting and recruitment department, um, looking at data for players all over the world, working very closely with the physical preparation department in terms of how fit and uh, how much training loads the players have done. So we try to, you know, we, it's not that we're, we're trying to support everyone. <clears throat> okay, so what does that, like, what does it mean to do data science in a soccer team? I thought maybe easy way to start thinking about is just we can go through some examples of the data sets that I have to work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you're not familiar with soccer, I'll just show it a 20 second clip and I can then link it into what data we will get from this clip. Oh, it's kind of out there. It's a clip from game two years ago. I'm going to assume that you guys could, could see my uh, video there, but so you kind of had a player drive up the center of the pitch, played out to the wing. A wing, wing, uh, the guy on the wing crosses it in to Cavallini, who heads in for a goal. So first of all, one of the data sets that we have are the players are all wearing GPS units. And so these uh, GPS units also have accelerometry. So we're getting live, not live, but we're getting their, um, their, how much they're running, what speed they're running at, what's their heart rate, how much they're accelerating, getting all those physical metrics from the players, which we can then download after the game and process and create reports on what the training loads of the players are. That's the majority of the work that we're doing for the physical preparation department. But outside of that, um, when, we're, when you think about tactical analysis or how can you evaluate how the team is playing or how different players are playing, one of the, the main data sources we have is something called event data. And so what event data is, is for every on the ball uh, action in the match, we are gonna get basically a tag of the X, Y location of that action, who made the action and what they're doing with the ball. So if, if you see the right of the screen here, you can kind of see how event data would summarize this, the clip that we just saw. As you can see, you now we see the pass from 12 to 31. You can see 31 drives the ball up the field, makes the pass to the left. You should join the link. Um, was that a question? Sorry about that. Uh, you can continue. I think it's just okay. muted. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So you can see that the, this is the what the event data would see from, uh, from that uh, sequence of play there. So obviously there's actually a decent amount of data here. You can see all the, what, it, where the ball has progressed. What's obviously missing here, if anyone knows soccer or just what you saw from that clip is that we're not seeing anything that happened that didn't happen on the ball. So you don't see anything about the defender locations in this, uh, in this event data summary. You don't see anything about other players on the pitch. So instead of, you know, the beautiful game having 22 players running around, we're only seeing this very small snapshot of what happened. Um, which brings us to our next clip here. So this is a new data source. So that it's called tracking data. Um, and this we've had this for about two years in the MLS. They've had it in basketball for close to 10 years. They've had it in baseball for a while. But basically what, it's, what happens is that there is cameras set up in all stadiums in the MLS, uh, 12 cameras in the stadium. And that actually through OCR recognition, they can actually track where all the players are on the pitch for 25 frames a second. Um, sorry, so let's try to get this to play, but you can sort of see this, this GIF on the right here. Is when, we de when we download, process the tracking data, you can actually see this is a much better representation of what just happened on the pitch. You can see not only just, you know, number 31 driving the ball forward and passing up to the wing, but you can see the location of all the other players. You can see the defenders. Etc. So you're getting a much richer story in order to do analysis with of what ha what is happening on in the game. So just to quickly summarize those two data sources that we have with the event data, you're getting between two and three thousand actions per game. Just when players are touching the ball, we're getting those recordings. Um, compared to with the tracking data, you're getting about 150,000 events per game because it's every it's 25 frames per second. We're getting everyone's location. So that. In terms of just like data scale, that's a much, uh, you know, 100x the size because we're getting, you know, over the course of a season, uh, it's about 100 gigabytes. So, you know, it's not big data per se, but it's, it's a decent chunk. Um, and then the trade-offs here are that with the tracking data, we're only getting MLS data. 
so with major league soccer, the, the league that we play in. So that means if we're if you're trying to use this for some sort of recruitment piece, you're not going to be able to do the same metrics that you create for MLS players on any other league in the world because we don't have that same data. So that's the, the main benefit of, of the event data. The first stream I talked about is that you can do, uh, we'll get all leagues around the world. We get about 100 leagues of that data stream. So, you know, depending on what project, what type of project you're looking at, that sort of picks what, uh, what data source you're going to look at. Um, so I think I'll just check the time here. So I've got about five more minutes. So I'll just go through quickly, like what, now you sort of have an understanding if you didn't before, if you're not a soccer fan of what data sources we might, uh, we might be getting. Now I'll quickly run through uh, a sort of a small, you know, example project that you can do with these data sources. Um, I will say that this isn't the most exciting example uh, because, you know, professional sports teams are notoriously pretty tight-lipped about exactly what they're doing. So I can't give you, you know, the most groundbreaking thing, even if we had it. So it's just a, a simpler example. It's, it'll be an expected goals model. Um, so it's sort of to preempt this, um, you know, a question that we could be asked is to sort of better understand our performances. So on a match-to-match -match level in soccer, it's very low scoring. You know, the most common scoreline is 2-1. So talking over 90 minutes is only, you know, a couple of goals. So sometimes just the scoreline doesn't give you that much information about actually how the game went and how we perform. So historically, the first thing, so traditional basic statistics on a match often was just looked at as how many, well, how many shots did we get? You know, maybe we didn't score any goals, but did we create chances? So let's look at how many shots we get. And if you don't know, a shot is just when a player, you know, takes a kick at goal. They attempt to shoot it at the net. Um, and say the you know it's a step back from goals. We're looking at shots. We can understand that just the number of shots doesn't tell you really anything about the quality of the shot. So expected goals tries to answer that question of what well, you know a shot quality metric. Are we is the shot a good chance? Is have a chance to score? So if we have time, I'll just show you a few quick examples of why it's important to not just look at the number of shots. Um, so this is just two shots you had from one game. You can see he, he takes a chance from about 25 yards away. That's going to be tough to score. The next chance. Sorry if I'm doing too many soccer videos for, for this presentation. I just think it's, think it's kind of fun. And you see the second one here, much closer to net. You know, he's looking at you know five yards away versus 30. So if you're just counting shots and counting those as equal, you're probably missing a bit of the story. So that's what an expected goals model is. It's just going to call shots, assign the probability that it's going to result in a goal. So it's value, giving you a value between zero and one. Uh, so this, these models you can think of can be any binary classifier. So you can pick the input of the shot, output a likelihood that it's a goal. So you can, you know, you can use a simpler model like logistic progression you know, all the way up to a non number if you want. Uh, this, this visual here is just you know, a sample of 300 shots. The orange ones are shots that weren't scored, the blue ones are shots that were scored. So you can think of different features you might use for a model, the, you know, the distance to goal, the shot angle towards the goal, uh, things, that, things like how close is the nearest defender, where is the goalie position, uh, things like that. Um, so once, once we have, you have an expected goals model, you're able to, Give a better storyline of understanding you know, of our shots. What what were the expected chances? What was the you know the value of these shots in terms of what was their probability to be scored? I mean, if you take ten shots, they were all you know, you know high value shots. Is probably worth more than twenty low value shots. And now we can sort of start answering that type of question. Um, so there's a lot of randomness on the game to game level in soccer in terms of in terms of scoring, but on the course of a season, you'll find that the total goals a team will score will be very much in line with the total XG, which is just the sum of those individual shot probabilities. So it sort of helps balance out when there's highs and lows in a season. You can start saying, okay, we've lost a few games in a row, but we've actually been creating good chances. We just haven't scored. Or, you know, on the other hand, maybe you've won a couple of games in a row, but you can sort of bring things down to earth by saying we actually have been getting a bit lucky to an extent. Um, so that, that would be sort of quick overview of, uh, what an expected goals model is. And they're very common now in soccer, uh, hockey, 
uh, sports like that. Uh, expected goals have now even sort of made it to the media um, where they're referencing expected goals, totals, and matches as well. So that was sort of a quick overview of a, you know, the first data science project that you might do with soccer data. Um, so now I'll kind of wrap it up with some, some lessons that I've learned along the way. Um, so, you know, in my job, it's a relatively new, data science is relatively new in, in the field. You often have very small teams. You're communicating with people that you're trying to, you know, reporting to don't necessarily have, you know, a data science background. So I've had more, it's been more effective when the, the, <clears throat> the projects I'm working on can be communicated better versus having the, you know, the utmost uh, complexity of your analysis. Um, in the field I'm working with, the, the project descriptions, the questions we're being asked may not always be uh, sometimes quite abstract or ambiguous. And you kind of have to be creative in how you're getting to the construct that someone's looking for. So it might, it's not always, a, you know, the Kaggle competition way of here's a data set, predict this exact thing. Sometimes you got to be creative in how you're thinking, you know, how a team question like, how does this team build up? Or how does, you know, what's the style of the, our upcoming opponent? Those are not simple questions asked that sometimes take some creativity in how you think about, you know, the data sources we have and how you get to get into, you know, help find some insight on those questions. Um, work on a pretty small team. So it means that, you know, you have to not only be just a data scientist, but there's also a lot of data engineering. You got to be thinking about, you know, data, data, you know, data management, how you're storing your data, all these different processes, you know, we're dealing with, it's not just CSV files anymore. I've got, you know, 100 gigabytes of tracking data per season. So it takes a, a diverse skill set, which kind of goes into my last point about it's always, uh, this is not like once you're a data scientist, doesn't mean that you've, you know, you, your learning has stopped. Like this field is always growing. You're always going to have to be learning new things. So it's not just in university, you're going to be learning new stuff. It's, you know, once you start on the job, you probably even be learning more. So it's a lifelong learning field for sure. Um, yeah, and I'd say that's, that's, I think I've gone over time here, so I'll wrap it up there and we can do questions later. So thank you. Thank you, Alexander. That was uh, very well in depth. Um, uh, it was, you can never have too many uh, soccer videos, in, in my opinion, <laughs> especially after, uh, of course, Canada secured the World Cup to, to go to Qatar. <laughs> Uh, no, but thank you. Uh, very, very insightful, especially about the, the models and um, the XG boost we talked about in the neural networks application. So thank you for, for going in depth about those. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Um, now I'd like to pass it on uh, to our next speaker. I can just share my screen. Uh, Mr. Zvi. Um, Mr. Zvi is a senior data Do scientist. A doctor, if you want to be formal, then doctor. Sorry about that, sir. Dr. Svi uh, will be our next speaker. Uh, he's a senior data scientist at Loblaws. So without further away, without further ado, uh, doctor, if you want to take it away. Okay, okay, let me share the screen. Uh, yeah, I did not prepare a very elaborate presentation like my previous. Actually, it was interesting to look at the, at the soccer. Uh, as an example of uh, a data science kind of pro, like, but uh, I, I do share kind of similar views that you can extract almost anything with data scientists give you like a lot of tools. Uh, the question is where, where do you choose to use this, these tools? Uh, so in my case, I kind of uh, made a, a career journey starting from uh, biology and using these tools in, in the realm of uh, basic science and, and life sciences uh, and made my way into um, a corporate environment. So that's kind of the, some of the lessons uh, learned in, in this journey. Um, but it, the, the journey itself started with undergraduate study actually in uh, the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, then I came to Canada and did the um, PhD at the University of Toronto. Uh, at the time, yeah, machine learning was not even uh, a coined as a term. Um, I was not using Python. I was not even using R, barely maybe some Perl script. And most of my work was uh, laboratory wet, wet bench work. 
but I definitely had an interest in, in kind of the, the data science side or the statistics side or in terms of uh, analyzing large sets of uh, experimental data and getting uh, extracting uh, insight out of it and, and also communicating my, my finding, uh, going to conferences, uh, publishing in a journal, uh, writing a PhD thesis, all of this is kind of a great um, a set of skills and they're transferable. If you, if you do a master's and you write a thesis, this is all uh, transferable to other domains and they're great, great skills and lessons to have. Uh, after I finished my PhD, I went and worked at the hospital of uh, six children as a postdoc fellow and later as an associate, working on um, a various problems in cancer research, uh, screening uh, libraries of molecules, uh, looking at the microarray data, trying to understand functions of genes, uh, trying to identify new therapeutics for uh, brain uh, tumors. Very, very interesting, very intriguing. Uh, but but also um, frustrating in the sense that these are complex problems. They're not easy to solve. Uh, you need uh, in, not not only you need access to laboratory uh, animals to study uh, patients to get the samples from. Um, you have to be embedded in in the right environment. It's a whole. It's a team effort. You have to um, to get funding. You have to get grants. Uh, it's it's a grind. You have to you have to have like the um, the the perseverance to go to go and pursue of it, and and on top of it also look for a job and get a um, a secure to secure your career based on that. Eventually, uh, I find myself uh, that I realize it's it's not really the right thing for me. Uh, I wanted something more more applicable, something that is not kind of um, very theoretical. Okay, you can write a paper, but I realize the. Um, the chances of me actually creating a therapeutic that will uh, treat a patient is low. I was looking at some of the maybe going uh, to a pharmaceutical company. Not too, too much research is happening uh, in, the, in the Toronto area at the time. Um, and I left Sick Kids and did. Uh, uh, am I? Sh I'm still sharing the screen, right? Um, so I left and did uh, an MBA at Ryerson University. And um, at the time I was starting to look more and more at, at business uses for data science and what kind of the, the what kind of marrying a science and business can, can do. Um, so I taught myself uh, R, I started uh, to look at the, uh, um, and, and other things that I learned in, in the MBA is the value in competitions, like Kegel competitions that was mentioned a little bit before, uh, and other like strategy competition, uh, because uh, kind of some of the lessons I learned is if you want if you want to kind of define yourself, if you want to to test yourself, if you want to show to prove the values that you have, you have to actually you know get out of your comfort zone. Uh, sit with people. I was sitting in competition in hackathon with people I never met before. Just forming a team, go and go and find a solution to a problem. Uh, go go and look at some data sets uh, um, from a telecommunication and and create a model for churn. And um, go. So I definitely got into the mindset of okay, find find a competition, and and you you're never going to win. Definitely not in the first time you enter. Uh, you learn. You learn from your experience. You learn how to how to work in a team. You learn how to uh, to quickly get to the to the main point and not waste time on things that are not important. Um, you learn how to to manage time, how to do things when they're very very strict uh, timelines. You know, hackathons typically is a, it's a weekend, not more than that. Uh, uh, some competitions are even kind of shorter, a few a few hours. So you have to quickly. You have to come prepare. You have to. Uh, come with some templates and quickly kind of work with what you have to get to the finish line with something that more or less look look like a product. You need also to to develop a salesmanship to to sell your solution. If you have you know, a brilliant solution, brilliant model, but you don't know how to communicate it, you're not going to to get uh, awarded. So many many, many variable uh, viable lessons that you learn in this type of uh, environment. And and life is unfortunately is a big a big competition. Um, I after after the MBA, I um, was doing um, a, I was working as a freelancer for 
uh, some pharmaceutical companies, but did um, several projects with virtual teams um, and mainly for a com as large seed company, Syngenta. Um, they were not all data science projects. Some of them were kind of more on the, on, the, on the laboratory science, finding ways to extract DNA was a project, finding better ways to uh, grow certain plants in the, uh, certain environments. So they, a lot of them were for things that my kind of my scientific um, a background was helping me so because the access to literature you have to go a lot of the time you have to go and see what else was done you can't just kind of innovate out of the blue you have to to usually you have to build on something that is already done either by your client or by or published in the literature so you have to quickly read papers summarize them and write a report convince your client that this is the right solution and and eventually um, I got more and more into the data science uh, side of things because it's such a, a great tool to, to back up your finding or to go in and look for a solution through the data of your client and, uh, and also uh, and differentiate yourself from the competition in, in what you can do with data. Uh, so in, uh, one good example was um, it, it, the task was to predict um, yields in soy. Soybean is um, a major crop in the United States, a little bit here in Canada as well. And the, the Syngenta is a seed company, uh, creates um, variants, uh, hybrids of soybeans, and they came up with a large data set of a, a historical um, yield. So how much, how much soy um, their experimental uh, yields uh, were harvesting in various locations and experimental farms in the United States. So it was kind of a, um, a it was a genetic data set there as well. So it's kind of a mixed, mixed type of data altogether, but with kind of a very kind of defined uh, problem. So in this case, kind of the problem was defined by the company of, can you create an algorithm that will, uh, based on all of this historical data to predict um, the the yields of soybeans so this is really valuable problem for them to solve because their their task as a, as a seed company is to sell um, high yielding variants to their farmers and of course you have to consider the weather Vers weather variations is number one uh, variables that will determine uh, the productivity of the field uh, there, are all, there are all kind of things that are actually hidden, right? So as data scientists, in this case, we didn't have access, we didn't know exactly uh, what was the, what fertilization the farmers were using, what uh, um, uh, what type of kind of a, a, a field management tools they were using. Uh, so they're all kind of there is again another kind of lessons from. In, in data science, you don't always see everything. You, you only, you're only limited by what your data uh, gives you. And, but if you, if you can find a way to uh, en enrich your data uh, and get additional source, you, you, this can be a, a differentiator between a winning solution and just a, a not so, so defined or not so well accepted solution. In this case, kind of my Kind of innovative solution was not not that innovative was okay um fields are always uh, seen actually by a satellite uh, because there are publicly available satellite data um, modis is one of them there are a bunch of others so um, i came up with an algorithm that actually kind of cheated a little bit uh, was looking on the fields because they they provided the, the geospatial locations of their fields so I was able to get the, the re corresponding satellite images uh, of the uh, soybean fields and train a, a model to extract uh, predictions based on the satellite uh, imagery. And this was considered kind of a, a very big innovation and a great solution. And uh, I got a, a, an award for it. I don't know if they actually implemented any of it or it took it, if they took it all the way to a product, but uh, I realize that it's kind of a great uh, opportunity to do something uh, with this type of uh, innovative uh, solutions. And I actually started uh, my own company 
um, and with some backing from um, uh, Next AI and, and uh, publicly available grants uh, to train um, uh, models uh, to do this on a larger scale, train models to um, make a, a create forecasts on the productivity of uh, corn and soybean uh, fields. And I had um, an insurance client uh, in the United States that was willing uh, to examine, to work with me, to give me data, to train models, and, and to um, evaluate the effectivity of uh, these models. And I still believe it's a, it's a great uh, opportunity, uh, but I didn't, uh, and uh, there were also Waterloo students that were, uh, that I recruited through the Waterloo uh, Works platform to work on this um, for several, for almost two years. Uh, but eventually I left this and joined uh, Labla again taking a lot of the kind of the lessons that I, I uh, learned along the way, but now going back to a uh, healthcare, uh, the healthcare space, and trying to um, implement some of the thinking. And so, because I believe it's it's not only kind of the tools that you're using; it's more the it doesn't matter if you code in Python or R or C plus plus. What really matters. Is is uh, a little bit what like what my, my previous speaker also said, and I, I agree with him. It's like kind of defining defining the problem, uh, understanding your data, getting to the point where where you can actually uh, say something informative or data before even throwing a model at it. It's just kind of understanding uh, what you see with your data and, and communicating it to your business partner is really really crucial. Uh, in, in the case of Flavla, it's we are a very large company, as you guys are aware. We, we have a grocery stores, a very dominant player in the Canadian market, but also since the acquisition of shoppers, we're also a dominant player in the pharmacy um, space. And, uh, and we are also innovating and, and creating new digital ways to communicate with our uh, customers. So PC Health is a good example of a digital app uh, that is developed at uh, at Labla and with with additional partners uh, to help uh, our customers navigate uh, and and monitor their health. Uh, so my uh, task coming into Labla was uh, you know, understanding the data, understanding uh, where so where is all of this data which is fragmented and it it, it sits. Uh, in many many places and it's really a kind of a challenge and still it is a challenge to pull it all together uh, into something that we can uh, say something informative out of it so we're talking about transactional data which is just, we have um, quite a bit but it's it's dirty data we don't always know exactly who is doing the transaction and we're knowing we know, we know that transactions were made luckily in in, in prescription it's a bit better because uh, we do know uh, who who is the who wrote the prescription. We know who is the the patient, um, but our our knowledge is is fairly limited. We don't know the whole. We don't have the whole clinical uh, picture of the patients. We don't have the clinical notes. We don't have the diagnosis. All all we see is really the the prescription, like the details of what molecule. Uh, this patient uh, was taking, but based on that, we can we can make a lot of of guesses, and they're often uh, right guesses. So based on the, on the type of medicines that you take, we know uh, what is your your diagnosis. Um, it, it's not kind of the device. We if we if we have a diagnosis and you don't take medication, we don't know. But if you take a medication uh, with certain conditions, we can uh, estimate with very strong. Uh, High confidence. What is what is your uh, diagnosis? Uh, and we are uh, continuously working to expand our, our data understanding. And um, and you can imagine that if we um, get a re a retail transactions from our retail stores, uh, and again our interest is is focused only on health, really. Uh, but of course, your retail transaction have a bearing on your health because you, your nutrition, what you eat determine a kind of your nutritional state in, in, the, in uh, our disease of interest, which are uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, what you eat make have an impact on your uh, health outcome. So we are in the business of uh, understanding uh, as much as we can. Meeting again, go. Oh. 
what, uh, what, where are you in your health journey? And, and, and it's a big data exercise because we have uh, millions of, uh, of uh, patients and, and millions of customers and they're uh, doing a lot of transactions in our system. So essentially our, our, our data science kind of uh, a journey is about extracting uh, the, the, the journey of our patients from our data who is aiming to eventually um, do a, a, some forecast both on the, on the aggregate, like on uh, cohorts of patients, where, where they're going to, uh, to do their shopping, where they're going uh, to, which doctors are going to see, uh, are they going to go to the hospital or not? Uh, how can we change their medication to save them from going to the hospital? Can we change their medication to improve their health? Can we uh, change their diet to improve their health? And there's kind of some of the big questions that we are uh, studying in my, uh, so it's a, it's a research team within um, a LABLA. So, uh, so there are, we are five uh, data scientists reporting uh, to me, but we're embedded in a larger organization. So there is data engineering, there is uh, enablement teams, there is solutions team, there are uh, IT solutions. So they are very, it's a very large company. And the, the trick is to, and there are also multiple, very, a lot, a great number of data scientists in various teams. The, the, um, uh, you, but you need to find kind of your niche. You need to find out where, what is the, your area of impact. You cannot solve all of the problems in the organization. You have to realize um, that you have um, um, a limited uh, set of, uh, 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 like, there are guardrails on what you can do and what you cannot do. Of course, there is also privacy and governments, not everything that we can, that, uh, that we are creatively kind of things that we can do. Sometimes we get, a no-no from data governance or privacy saying, okay, you cannot just go and, and tell these patients to, right, to, to, to change their, their uh, prescription, right? You need, you need to consult the, a healthcare physician, you need FDA approvals. Uh, so they're not everything that, that we think we can do with data science is actually um, a, a, um, a legitimate uh, solution. So we have to find a way uh, how to work, how to actually go all the way from our data sets and our innovative models and solution all the way to the, to the patients or to the pharmacists or to the healthcare physician in this case, um, to actually impact the health of our a customer. And, and, and before closing, just a kind of a, one kind of, if I, if I want to distill um, kind of what, what I learned and what maybe is, you, is helpful for, for, a, for you guys is, taking um, it's a, a framework that kind of we made up trying to consult to reconcile what what we know from science how science work uh, to uh, design thinking and putting kind of the, the the customer in the center and making sure that we are not just kind of spinning our wheels in research and doing things that nobody is really uh, is interested in or going to use so that's some one, some of the the lessons um, is, that I learned is not to uh, not to get carried too far away with kind of you know models and tools and and new new libraries in Python and new models uh, to sit with your stakeholders and and uh, make sure that you deeply understand uh, the problems that your solutions are, are can fit in in what the, the your users uh, can actually do and, and quickly iterate on it and your first module doesn't have to be very sophisticated it could be kind of a simple regression model just kind of to test the water to see uh, what, is, what is the accuracy of, if you can solve something with regression, no need to do very deep uh, uh, learning models with uh, billions of parameters. Uh, so, so but, but, you need, but you need to test your solutions with your stakeholder. You need to quickly find out is, is this uh, solving the problem or not, or, or um, and, and based on that, iterate, iterate until you, and sometimes you need to pivot. Sometimes you realize, okay, it's it's not even a good direction. It's it's not a solvable problem, or uh, or or the customer don't always understand, uh, can verbalize and understand the problem in a way that you can solve it for it for the customer. So you need to uh, to listen very carefully to what the customer uh, is saying. Um, 
to, uh, to find out if you're in the right direction or not. And if you're not in the right direction, sometimes you need to pivot sometimes. Um, and again, in research, we have the luxury of sometimes even changing our customers or saying, okay, th this is a great solution, but not for this customer. We have actually to sell this to a different customer uh, within the organization. Startups, sometimes it's kind of, it's, you live and die. If, if your if you're, um, customer doesn't adapt your solution, you run out of money and it's the end of the startup. In large corporations, there is more, more leeway and more um, opportunities to change courses. Sometimes you don't have this luxury. Uh, and I, I find myself thinking a lot about the problem. So Albert Einstein is, is sort of said, um, if you have an, only an hour to solve a problem, you, you devote 55 minutes to think about the, the problem or the, ask the questions before jumping uh, into solution five if you understand the the problem or ask the right questions it will take you only five minutes to solve the the solution that, to get this aha moment but but you have to really spend the 55 minutes iterating on the question diving deep into the question uh, diving into your data to to understand the problem understand the question so that's that's my two cents Thank you, Dr. Svi, for, for that wonderful insight. I think two big takeaways, at least for, for me personally, was, uh, like you said, like you mentioned, a lot of, as, as, as students personally as well, um, it's very easy to get carried away with learning the models, learning the, uh, the technical implementation that sometimes we get carried away and don't ask the right questions to, to guide our problem solving. So it's, it's important you mentioned that, and as well as the, um, kind of the ethics surrounding medical data as well is very important. Uh, you have the privacy of the clients and you have a lot of considerations with, with the law as well as the government. So uh, that's, that's certainly very unique uh, to, to that medical field as well. So thank you for, for going in, into detail with, with that. I will now uh, like to transition into the Q and A, uh, short Q and A uh, section of this uh, presentation. So, if anyone has anyone from the audience has any questions uh, for our speakers, uh, it can be for a specific speaker or for all of our speakers. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself or, or leave it in the chat. Uh, if no one has any questions, um, we do have some pre-submitted questions uh, for our speakers as well. Okay, so it looks like we do have a question in the chat. Um, the question is, um, thank you for your presentations, they were great. I was just wondering if you have any suggestions for someone just starting out. Um, so it is a question directed for all of our speakers. So if, if we could answer uh, from the first speaker to the third speaker in order, that, that would be great. Yeah, so for this question, my take would be like, I would emphasize more on data pre-processing rather than building out a model. Like you can easily learn a model within maybe maybe one hour or so, but the data pre-processing is, is much more emphasized in, in the real life. So you should spend a lot of time in cleaning the data because the data is like unstructured, not very clean and tidy. So I think like you should all use some uh, unclean data sets rather than data sets which are openly available like iris or mnist and apart from that i might suggest you guys to at least get familiar with one of the cloud computing plat platform like whatever it might be like aws or gcp or azure like anyone it's it's all the same but you should at least understand one of the three cloud flame frameworks it is easy when you actually get into a company or an organization adapt quickly with whatever the cloud they are using in. Yeah, this might be my takeaway for this question. Yeah, um, thanks for the question. I guess it depends on um, it's where you're at. You you're say you're just starting out, so then I, I would recommend, you know, if you're at university, you're a great place to be learning. So if there's an intro statistics course or an intro data science course, probably, you know, getting your feet wet you know, coding, handling data, 
learning, whether it's R or Python that you're learning, it probably doesn't matter, or if, whether it's C++, or if it's an intro programming course, I think just because you're in university, it's a, it's a great place to learn. Joining this club, coming to events is also a good idea, but taking a few courses to, to learn some of the fundamentals is always good. Uh, for my my end, again, like, as I said it in my presentation, I would go and find a competition. There are so there are so many of them. A hackathon, join, uh, do as many as you can, and uh, you try to enjoy it. It's it's a bit stressful, but you you'll do. There'll be so much learning. Uh, it's really worth the the effort. Kegel competition on your own in a team. Um, uh, there are a, AI for good. Uh, there's so many uh, competitions out there with deadline, without deadline, uh, with uh, various variations of topics. Uh, I mean, ideally find some, some topics that you can relate to and you have some knowledge of um, because you need something to keep you going. If it's just kind of, a, some, it depends, depends on your personality. Some people just are uh, motivated by, the, there is a problem to solve that's enough to motivate them. Some people want uh, something that is a little bit more than, so this is more specific that the problem has to be, you know, in the health domain, or if this if this is of your interest. If it's a a, a, good, a good example is a, a, a sustainability, right? So there are actually now a bunch of competitions around using a data science in the realm of you no know, agriculture, sustainability, reducing emissions. Um, just find find something that you're passionate about and some competitions that you can think your teeth on. Yeah, for sure. Thank you uh, for your answers, uh, speakers. Uh, I did have a specific question for Alexander, uh, which is um, to enter in sort of like a, a sports data analytics um, uh, industry. Do you have to have any prior sports uh, experience or any any knowledge about the sports to to break into that field? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think that. Um... Not necessarily. I think in all industries that you're working at, having uh, domain knowledge is helpful because, like, like we uh, we all try to sort of emphasize is that understanding the questions being asked is just such a big part of uh, part of being successful and part of you know your job. So I think that the more you understand the sport you're working in, it's you know it's going to be easier to understand the questions. So I think there is going to be a bit of that. But I wasn't you know a competitive soccer player past the age of twelve, so I've definitely learned a lot of soccer through the through the job so i think that you can learn some of these things on the job but a baseline knowledge is definitely helpful and i'd say that's probably for for any industry you, you do need to be able to understand what the data like where it's coming from yeah i, I would totally agree and it looks like we have a question from chelsea um so thank you all for the presentations they were very insightful i was wondering how would you communicate data-driven results that might contradict uh, business goals? Okay. Uh, so Naga, do you wanna sort of kick us off? So can you elaborate this question more? Like, I think I, I can take it, a crack of it. It's, it's actually a good, it's a good, it's a good question and it's, um, it relates to kind of the, the integrity. Like we don't, I mean, there, like no engineer, I'm not an engineer, but I know. So engineers have kind of a code of, of ethics, right? So engineer will not build a bridge, you know, that will collapse in, in two seconds because the business told me, okay, it's cheaper, right? The, if you were an engineer and your, your manager told me, okay, you, you can't spend uh, that much money on the bridge, but so just uh, instead of uh, iron put uh, paper there, uh, engineer will not, uh, will not do it. I, I, like we we some, we as data scientists maybe need to 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 come up with some kind of equivalent a code of conduct where um, there is a kind of integrity in the, in the field. So if we see a problem in in the data through through our data, right, we can do uh, we can reveal things that are really not pleasant for the business uh, to hear. And uh, and often their their kind of their solution is okay. Don't look don't look there. Okay, just. Uh, or kind of okay what what like it, it happened to me a few times right so um, a recent example 
uh, we're some of some of the stuff that we're doing is is a, a survey. So we run survey large, large surveys, uh, sometimes with our customers, sometimes in, with the general public. And so we ask certain questions and and collect certain answers. And sometimes they don't like they don't like to, uh, the answers as they think. So kind of the immediate say, okay, why did you ask this question? And just just remove this question. Said, no, as, as a data scientist. Removing a, a, a question is, is altering the data. Altering the data is, is the cardinal sin. You don't alter the data. You, you can alter kind of your analysis. You, you can add more data, but you don't just you know, delete data or, 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 or change the data just to make the business look better. That's not, that's not a solution. So you have to, you have to develop a, 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 your skin kind of a, and your ability, kind of your spine, to go and, and tell the business things that they're not always present to hear, or or timelines, right? Sometimes they expect you to solve this problem, uh, you know, in a month, and you know it will take a year. You you have to to be honest and and tell the, and set set the expectation right. So, so it's it's a you have to negotiate a lot in this in this business. Yeah, definitely uh, requires a lot of integrity. Um, to to not be afraid to show unpleasant results like you like you said, doctors V. Um, is was there anything you you'd like to add, uh, Naga or Alexander? No, I think that was a good answer. It kind of hit on some of the points. That's that's just a lot of times people maybe are hoping that the the data, the insights confirm maybe some of their own biases of or how they think it will look. So it can be challenging when it goes against what people what people believe. Um, so it's just. I guess you got to lean into that sometimes and kind of pick your pick your battles or know know how to approach it. Yeah, I totally agree. For sure. Thank you. Thank you both for for answering that. Um, I did have a question directed for uh, Doctor Spi, uh, which is when you're working with medical data or when you're working with uh, very, uh, I'd say data that has a lot of high risk. Um, so do you take any extra precautions when you're forming your conclusions? Um, so it, when you're, for example, assessing a clinical trial, do you take any extra precautions to make sure the model is working to a higher degree of accuracy than in, in a normal uh, situation? Uh, okay, so I mean, yeah, so, so first of all, we are not running clinical trials, but yeah, when, when, you, do, when you do run a clinical trial, there is added, there are many kind of uh, layers that are there to to make sure that that the data is is trustworthy. And number one is the control uh, control rule. Right? So so again, that's not something that uh, not definitely I didn't invent it, and it's kind of an old practice. So clinical trials are kind of uh, I guess the equivalent if you're a data scientist on your train set and your test set and how you split it again. Like it's something. It's a very valuable lesson in. In, in your career, and you're going to you're going to uh, learn it one way or another by failing, right? So, the, it happened to me so many times with, especially with the, the Waterloo students, for example, the co-ops. They come and said, "Okay, we, we solved the problem. We have an excellent model." And then you go and you sit with them, and you, you, you the first thing that you discover is that there is a leakage between the training set and the test set, and the model is just overfitting based on some, some uh, in a bad design of the experiment. So that's something when you do clinical trials, you cannot, you cannot allow yourself to fall in this, in this pit. And there is very rigorous um, statistics around how you design your experiment, who, are, who is your control, and make sure that you have a control, all of these kind of uh, bells and whistles. So the more we bring this, this practice from the clinical world into anything that we do in data science, the better the better we are. The more we can trust our models and our our approaches. So it's it's and it's of course it's even more important if the decisions are around medications or around uh, something that will affect the impact of the health of the science. But even I would say the success of your soccer team is uh, in in Alexander's example would be also uh, important for for the, the teams and the uh, and the fans right so so you you there is always um, 
uh, impact of our work is actually impacting wherever we are is impacting real businesses, real people. And we have to uh, consider that it's not just a kind of a mathematical problem that you need to solve. Uh, whatever we're, we're doing is affecting real, real people. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you for, for answering that question. Um, definitely, I definitely do agree uh, with the answer. Um, there was a question in the chat from uh, Lauren, uh, directed towards Alexander. Uh, Lauren is saying, uh, I was just wondering how you use data to help goalkeepers, if you do at all, and do your insights directly change the training of the goalkeepers? Uh, thanks for the question, Lauren. Uh, I'm wondering maybe were you a keeper yourself, uh, perhaps? Um, the it, For goalkeepers, I'd say it's probably one of the harder positions to evaluate the performance. Um, we do obviously keep track of the physical loads. You can see the from a training perspective, how much they're jumping, how much they're diving, uh, I can be monitoring those training loads. Um, not as much right now on the analysis of the keeper's tactical play, but there is a, it's a famous sports analytics conference um, called the Sloan uh, Sports Analytics Conference that happened uh, last month. And I think there was a, a new paper sort of showing how to evaluate goalkeeper, goalkeeper positioning in one-on-one in -on -one situations that I haven't taken a look at yet. But um, if you're interested, you can, reach out on LinkedIn, I could forward the paper along. Awesome, thank you, Alexander. And uh, Anusha had a question uh, for Dr. Aviv, um, more related to the expertise in the domain uh, when you're working in, in data science. Uh, he is asking, how do you think your unique educational background has helped your success in the field of, of data science? Yeah, so I mean, it, I I am uh, very well educated, and and I love. First of all, I love learning, so I don't mind. The, I don't think that there is over education, uh, but for me, it served me well because the, the PhD gave me very strong uh, foundations in in science. So this the data science part. I I see the science is more even important than the data. I'm not I'm not an engineer by training. I don't understand uh, how computer works. But I understand very well uh, nuances in the data and, and study design, uh, things like that. So that's, that's I learned mostly in my PhD. I made the, the decision to go back to school and do an MBA after a PhD, and that gave me kind of a whole other kind of lens to looking. Uh, I, I never study economy in my in my PhD. I never study a business. I never study. Um, even some, some of the technology aspects, because my, my focus in the PhD was, even if I use statistics, it was very narrowly in, in the, the lens of basic science. Doing the MBA kind of opened my, my mind to using uh, statistical tools in business environment, uh, learning finance, uh, learning a little bit of management. So MBA is a little, kind of a little bit catch-all uh, uh, education that gives you kind of a little bit of everything, but that's the, the the higher you go, kind of in the, in the management ladder, you realize that you need. It's not enough to be a great data scientist because you'll work with a team. You need to know how to manage a team. And you need to know uh, you work with a team of teams, right? There are multiple teams, and you need to uh, develop skills or uh, in communication. You need to develop. Uh, so there is a, education is is fantastic, but also. Um, not not only like what you learn when you sit in class, but also being like in the MBA was very great at creating teams, working in a team. In my in my PhD, it was not really a team; like it's it's a kind of a, a individual sport. I would say more more than a team sport. But when you uh, business is all about uh, teams, and uh, so there there are all kind of uh, uh, things that you learn in the education just uh, from listening to, to classes, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, but, uh, but also from the environment where you're in, interaction with your peers, um, learning uh, kind of uh, uh, with the, um, this, again, like the competitions, again, is something that I learned uh, at the MBA because there was definitely a, an emphasis on going and representing the school in strategy competition, in data competitions, 
so just take take everything that you can um, now networking and another thing that, that I learned uh, in the MBA I would, like science there is networking but it's not as as uh, uh, there is not so much emphasis on networking you won't be able to find a job uh, I believe unless you uh, you network uh, into into it and there are various ways to techniques to do it putting yourself we as data scientists tend to be kind of uh, introverted sitting in the corner doing our code you have to learn to put yourself out to to uh, to network with people that you never met to sell yourself to other people you have to there is a lot of, of learning uh, involved for sure thank you uh, for your insight um, I do believe we have time for for one more question and, and that's all uh, for for all of our speakers here today and it's uh, if you could uh, pinpoint just one thing uh, for us students to interested in in, in, a, in a career in data science to to focus on in, in our early career, uh, what would be the one thing to to focus on and work on and really uh, develop? So my take would be learning. So it is an iterative process. So whatever you do, you try to learn it. So it is not like you just had an assignment and you just delivered whatever the assignment asked you. So you should iterate yourself, see where you can actually utilize whatever the model you're using or whatever the pre-processing steps you are actually conducting on. So it's the base, like it's the pillar of data science, like the pre-processing, understanding the data. So maybe the data which you are actually working on right now might not be the data which you see in future. But if you try to understand or dig deeper into the data, then you might find some results which are not even came into the picture or not even has been established till date. So that might be my take on this thing. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'll boil it down to this. So many excited things, but I would say, you know, on top of that, I think a lot of you're in a great place in school, probably internships coming up to learn a lot of the technical skills. So then I would say to also then focus a lot on the soft skills, the communication, um, you know, things like networking, like was just previously mentioned communication. I think, you know, if you go to a, a, a hackathon or you do a personal project on the side, like writing up blog post game and used to, you know, putting in your results in, you know, a readable format um, in a nice presentable way. So I think the soft skills become really important in terms of, not only just getting your first job, but also then being successful when in it. For sure, for sure. And I think uh, Dr. Zvi does have to leave. And um, with that, I, I, I would like to wrap up this event. Uh, thank you, Naga and Alexander, for, for your answers. I definitely do agree with both of those, those things mentioned. And I'd just like to thank uh, Alexander Naga and, and Dr. Zvi for, for your time and effort in, in these presentations. Really, really great insights uh, all across the board. Uh, definitely learned a lot of different new things. And on behalf of, of University of Waterloo Data Science Club and, and myself, certainly uh, a big thank you for your time uh, today and, and, and your uh, time to answer questions as well. Thanks for having us here. Yeah, thanks so much for listening and thanks for organizing. And, yes. Yeah. Good luck with your exams, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you to everyone in the audience for, for coming. And we hope to see you soon in future Data Science Club events. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, Rodrigo. Thank you so much, Alexander. We'll keep in the, touch. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, keep in touch. Presentations were okay lengthwise and sort of what you're expecting. <laughs>